present. All right, I hope you see this. If you don't see it, you can just switch on your microphone on top. So the outline for at least this first part is to define some concepts. For example, what is anonymization? What is pseudo anonymization? And other terms that we will come across. And of course, why is it important? You know, why are we here? Do we, you know, if it's if it wouldn't be important, maybe you know we could find something else to do with our life. Um, and then the second, I think that the best way to understand anonymization is by understanding re-identification, meaning you know how can we literally re-identify an individual from their from their personal data or supposed to anonymize personal data. And then after the break, we I will briefly mention something that then we will go deeper in the future in the next days of this course. But basically, kind of you know how we are gonna do and how people work with anonymization as well as um, also workflows when anonymization is not possible sometimes you can't anonymize your data then you need a, a, a solution to work with uh, with data that cannot be anonymized okay so well i guess i already said this this is not a computer science course so hopefully you will not be disappointed but the goal here is practical that all of you by the end of this course can actually be identify or anonymize or at least you know be aware that the data that you are accessing is not anonymous even though the people who gave you the data said that it's anonymous so some references to start there's a very nice link from the social archive finnish science social social science archive which has a long and detailed but really nice page like if you really want to spend some time i recommend reading the whole page um, so most of the concepts if not all of the concepts are also covered here but this is a very good reference and within the page there are other books and links for for more information if you really want to learn more about the kind of theory and logic behind all this and at least for those at alto but the page is actually open um, we recommend a kind of a step-by-step -step how to handle personal data in research. So basically, this is a good way, you know, not just not just focused on anonymization, but in general how to handle the personal data from the collection to the publication. And in general, for those at Alto, if you are in doubt, please just ask and send an email to research data at alto.fi we follow the account and we always try to find an answer all right so let's start with some uh, concepts and definitions so we consider anonymization in the context of research data with human participants so personal data other types of personal data that is kind of not related to research my benefit of the same techniques here but uh, the focus here is of course for research data so personal data is a broad concept under the eu's general data protection regulations or gdpr i'm sure you heard about it and the definition is that personal data is any data about a living people a living individual from which they can be identified so if you collect information from individuals or information about individuals, then you should consider it. Um, what is this? Then, you, then you should consider it um, personal data. So another important concept that we need to introduce is kind of the distinction between direct and indirect identifiers. So take this information as a dynamic, meaning that what we might call today a uh, you know indirect identifier or anonymous data tomorrow might not be anonymous anymore but um, on top of it it's um, it, it's never zero or one because even a name and surname might not be a direct identifier in the sense that there might be more people with the same name and surname 
but uh, but in general so you know the more information like there are different types of information so for, with some of this information it's very easy to re-identify a person and these are the direct identifiers with other types of information it takes a little bit more information but in the end you can still re-identify a person so with direct identifier it's information which is sufficient on its own to identify an individual so as i said personal name or email address or the social security number a fingerprint the facial image you know what do you use also your your passport for example stores this this so-called biometric image fingerprint of your of your face the voice a brain scan brain scan is basically like a you know the structural brain images is like the fingerprint of your of your finger so all this type of information is uh, is a direct identifier because you can you know with high probability re-identify somebody then information which can be used to identify an individual fairly easily so these are labeled as strong indirect identifier so for example a postal address it's you know it might postal address on address on its own in some cases there's only one person living at that address and then it's not too difficult to re-identify in some other cases, you know, it might not be enough because it's a huge building. But in general, all these little bits of information that are linked to an individual, there is a way, although it's a somewhat indirect way, because you need to access some extra data from somewhere else so that you can re-identify the person. So it's interesting, for example, the, the so-called IP address of a computer, the internet protocol address. So this is, you must have seen that often when you visit a website these days, if not always, you always need to click that, you know, please accept our privacy policy because we use these cookies. And the idea is exactly this, because they are tracking some of your direct, indirect identifiers. They might not know exactly who you are, but with enough linking, you know, it, would, it wouldn't be too difficult to to re-identify you out of this type of information. And then we have the so-called not strong indirect identifier, but just indirect identifier. So this is information that on its own is not enough to identify someone, but linked with more information, you know, you might already be able to you know, re-identify somebody. So, there's some list here and all this information is taken from the page from the Finnish uh, social science archive the Tampere University link that I gave at the beginning then there are of course techniques to reduce the risk of processing like um, of process like to reduce the risk of processing for the data subject and these techniques are there are basically two types of techniques pseudonymization and anonymization or at least these two are the one that you most see so with pseudonymization you mean that the removal or replacement of identifiers with pseudonyms or codes which are kept separately and protected for example you know by the technical or organizational measure so this is like saying that for example you collected some data with strong identifiers and then instead of having in your table the name and surname and email address of your participants, you just replace them with the number. But you still keep somewhere else the kind of, you know, the key that subject number one was this person with this email address and subject number two, someone else, etc. So the data are called pseudo-anonymous, but by definition, pseudo-anonymous data is still personal data as long as the additional identifying information exists. So if there is a way, as I said earlier, to re-identify somebody, then it's still personal data. Instead, anonymization, anonymization is really when you kind of destroy your data, you change your data so that you kind of, you irreversibly remove identifying information from the data so that it's impossible and meaning in a mathematical sense that it's mathematically impossible to re-identify 
anyone from that from that data. It's a really strong statement, and it's re- that's why it's very difficult to have fully anonymous data because sometimes you can still single out an individual, and I will show this later. But um, but the more you destroy the data, so for example, the more you remove any possible special outlier, then uh, the more your data becomes anonymous until you can really call it anonymous that it's that it's impossible to re-identify single individual so often in legal terms you see this sentence which is reasonably likely all the means reasonably likely to be used for the identification of individuals must be considered when assessing whether the data is being anonymized so this is also what i meant earlier that the picture is somewhat dynamic so today maybe it's reasonably likely that um, that some level of anonymization is fine and you can consider your data anonymous i will explain more this later when we talk about k anonymity for example but um, if you want to play it safe and and you know if you really want to tell your subject that your data is anonymous you know don't promise something that you are not sure that you can promise and just treat it as personal data information available from other data sources shall also be taken into account when considering if a person are reasonably likely to be identified so this is what i mean that even if you think that you de-identified and anonymize your data as much as possible that it's truly anonymous then maybe by linking other information that people can find somewhere else it, you you might be able to to re-identify somebody so then do not promise an anonymization full anonymization if you are unsure yourself that it is fully anonymous okay then then we need to think of why do we need to anonymize personal data in research so you know why are we here why do we want to learn about this thing so as usual in research there are two types of, of requirement and they do not strictly overlap there are of course the legal requirements when we process personal data and they are set in the gdpr so for example you know one of the requirements that you should not store the personal data indefinitely um, but then when it comes to scientific research academic research there are also ethical considerations that we need to take into account when it comes to Finland we follow the guidelines provided by Tank, and that's the link here in um, how to basically the ethical guidelines to work with human subjects I'm focusing here so these guidelines they kind of cover non-medical studies medical medical ethics is a different topic but as you know at Alto we do not cover or at least the ethics committee at Alto does not cover uh, medical ethics application um, so the focus here I'm focusing on these guidelines on the 10 guidelines where they say for example that personal data must be removed from research data when it is no longer necessary in order to carry out the research so imagine that you you are collecting I don't know some questionnaires from your participants if you really need to store the let's say email address which is quite a strong identifier because they need to take part to a new questionnaire in a few months then you know you have a reason for doing that and you can do that legally with the gdpr if you specify for example in the study and in the privacy notice that you need to store this information and it's also ethical because this is what you need for for your research but if it's clear that you were just planning to collect one sample from these individuals and you don't literally need your their email address or their identities anymore you should delete it there's no there's no you know you shouldn't store data just because you never know one day you might have a new idea so it is you know it is more important to to get rid of what you don't need and then eventually you know collect more data if something got lost then um what's the time 12.39 okay some other concepts that are important that I've already mentioned when I was talking so 
I also sometimes use the term de-identification. So as I was mentioning earlier, you know, there's no black or white. It's a multiple shades from, uh, from black to white on how anonymous a data set is. So sometimes um, we refer, we use the term de-identification. With, with de-identification, we refer to the process of removing or obscuring these direct identifiers. So one example that we will see um, on the last day is with medical images. So as I mentioned earlier, some traits, like for example, the, the folding of the, of, of the brain, they're like the, finger, the fingerprint. So they are quite unique for each. They are unique for each individual, but still we can, from that type of data, we can still remove, for example, if it's some patient record, we can still remove the name and the surname that is in the that is in the record, and we can still remove, for example, the 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 face when we collect the MRI, for example, but we don't need to store the face if what we need to study is just uh, is just the brain. Um, then other concepts that we will introduce you is the concept of re-identification of the anonymization which basically means recovering the identities of an individual from an anonymized data set. So, and this is what I mentioned earlier, the technology might be advancing and what we call, you know, what yesterday was anonymous might not be anonymous anymore because there's new technology or there's more information that you can start linking and, uh, and so re-identification is always a, a possibility with the uh, with personal data with pseudonymized personal data and then another concept that you often see is the concept of minimization which kind of links to what i was mentioned about the research ethics guidelines so the idea of being use and store only the minimum amount of personal data that you really need do not just collect everything about an individual just because you never know so it is good even from the planning stage when you prepare your i don't know grant application or data management plan or or register uh, protocol or register report even before collecting the data you clearly outline what you really need for your research because if you don't need to store their emails like i mentioned earlier then just don't store them it is nice that you show both to the subject and to the authorities that you have a kind of a minimization strategy that you really are interested in studying, I don't know, the link between height and head size, height and head size. And then, you know, those are the two types of personal data that you need to collect. You don't need any, any other data that you might be able to collect on the way. Okay, so maybe before, it's still too early for the break, but maybe, I want to quickly check the HackMD because there might be some interesting. No, there's no questions. <laughs> okay, let's keep it. Whether I was so clear or you fell asleep or a mix of both. But in general, you know, if you have some question, I paste again this link to this interactive document in the Zoom chat. So if you have questions, you can write them here if something came, came up. Okay, well then we can continue with this um, example of re-identification before our, our break. So we still have some 15 minutes. So, no, I pressed the wrong button. So what I was saying earlier is that in my opinion, the best way to understand anonymization is through re-identification, which is often some sort of a game that you can play that when somebody claims that they have found or invented a new system where data can be fully you know, stored securely or analyzed securely, then you can always start thinking of the most absurd scenarios to show that actually, you know, you can always find a way to re-identify somebody which in, in the end even goes, you know, there is someone in Finland that has the key to the whatever secret storage of all your personal data. So, you know, 
through anonymization is never possible. There is always a way to re-identify re re somebody. But once again, you know, if you know and you're happy that the effort would be way too big, then you are fine and you're doing the best you can with the technology that we have these days. So let's imagine, for example, that we collect data from 300 individuals in a village. And now for simplicity, let's say that we just collect um, age, all right? So we wanted to be, you know, we understand that age can be, you know, if I would ask, let's say for the birth date, um, if I would ask for the, for the birth date uh, and maybe even the time, you know, that would be quite a strong identifier because maybe, you know, there's very few babies who are born in exact day and, 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 and exact time. But often in the questionnaire, you say, you know, you, you don't, you, they don't ask you your exact birth age and birth time, but they're happy to, for example, collect the decade. So are you in your 20s or in your 40s or in your 60s, etc. So this, in this village, most people, you know, were in their less than 80s, but few of them were quite old. And apparently one person was over 100 years old. So it's clear that in this village, you know, even though it might be difficult to, from this data set, to know which one of the people in their thirties are part of this study of this data set, but for sure you know yourself maybe that there is only one person who's older than one hundred years old in the village, and sometimes this type of information even goes in the news because somebody is now one hundred years old and Il Calestis decides to write a story about it. So you know suddenly at least one subject in this data set is not anonymous at all. And you know, now there's a risk for this individual that their personal data might be, might, might be leaking, okay? So the idea here is that it's the, the idea of the, of the un, identification or anonymization is some sort of blurring, right? So this picture here is like a blur it's, it's exactly what we do with the with the faces that if you clearly see a face then okay you can tell that person is Enrico but if you start blurring the face with small blurring like you know you might still see Enrico but then with more blurring you might not be able to see to see the face anymore and recognize who is behind the face although I will soon show that even that is not enough but um, also this kind of information is a blurred version of a more fine grain information right so here instead of asking the people to write down if they are in their 30s or 40s or or whatever here they would write down the actual age so now suddenly you know it's just not just this person who was over 100 years old but there's even just one person here is i don't know who is 45 year old maybe it's the only 45 45 year old in the village you know so that the more fine grain we go with our with what we ask from our subjects, the less anonymous the data, the data set is. So increasing the granularity of data makes the subjects more identifiable. And then we go to the finest grain, which is basically now we ask for the exact date of birth and even the actual time, you know, that is registered in the hospital. So now suddenly in this village everyone so now the the location of each of this kind of histogram very dense histogram is an exact time in second when someone was born in my in my simulation okay i had a couple of subjects who were born on the same time in the same second but you know so it's clear that now the information is like a fingerprint so now it's clear that almost for every one of these 300 individuals there is a unique identifier, which is like their entry premise, their social security number. So now we call the K anonymity of this data set one, which means so with K anonymity, it means that the level of K of one, it means that we can single out one individual with the data contained in them. Because now this time of birth is like a unique identifier. Instead, when we were kind of zooming out a little bit, making things more blur, here we still have gain anonymity of one because we can still single out some individuals. And then we were blurring out even more. And you know, if we look at this data, the K anonymity would actually be above 30. 
meaning that each kind of group age, group range, age range, sorry, each age range would kind of be containing at least 30 individuals. But then when you start adding the people that are older, you still have a key anonymity, anonymity of one. So basically you can regroup reading your data and your age range so that for example here we obtain a k anonymity of 70 so in the end in your questionnaire it would be like asking you know are you younger than 20 are you between 20 or 40 40 or 60 or older than 60 then with that type of question in your questionnaire then you know that with enough data after collecting for example 300 individuals you are not able to tell apart 70 70 of them because in each kind of beam of the distribution of your of the age of your participants there is this level of k equal to 70 or more so as i write here each person contained in the release cannot be distinguished from at least k minus one individuals whose information also appear in this in this data set but this type of anonymization technique is called generalization now you understand of course that if now we were using just age and it's okay we, we were able to for example reach a level of k anonymity decent level of k anonymity just using age but often we collect more pieces of information from the same individual so that maybe you know it might well be that there is some structure in your data that actually all the people of all the people, I don't know, here, they were older than 60, that maybe they were, there was just one male and they were all female. So suddenly, even though when you look at the age, the data is K anonymous, when you look at the, at the gender or the sex, the data is not anonymous at all because you can single out the, the only 60 plus male in, that, in this little village. So it's kind of a good example to understand this is the, Hopefully you ever you you played with this game, the guess who in English, the board game. So with this board game, you basically need to ask the opponent, you know, is the person that I need to re-identify, I don't know, wearing a hat. And then by knowing yes or no, you can already start to single out which one is the right person. So it can be demonstrated that on average, with four questions, you can actually uniquely identify one of these one of these uh, participants, one of these, whatever they're called, figuring in this, uh, in this game. So even though each piece of information alone, you know, let's say that the color of the hair alone would keep the data K anonymous enough, but when you start combining color of hair, eyeglasses and hat, then maybe that's it, that there's just one person that, that has these three types of information. So in a more scientific context, this was actually shown in a nice study in nature, nature communication a couple of years ago. So here they noticed, here they had access to a huge amount of so-called registry data, census data from um, the state of Massachusetts, if I remember correctly. And what they noticed is that with three types of identifiers, and here, so with the date of birth, the gender and the zip code, the postal code. So with three types of identifier, I help you out read this curve. So basically they obtain this blue curve, which means that with three types of identifier, only few subjects can be re-identified with 100%. Some, uh, you know, a good percentage of subject can be re-identified with 80% accuracy, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the meaning of this distribution. But then immediately when you start adding for example, the number of cars that they own. Now, you mean, so when you start adding the number of vehicles on top of these three uh, personal data items for each individual, suddenly you, you can re-identify an individual from 80 to 100%. So this is the, the meaning of this curve. So that the distribution becomes really like this, that many, many subjects can be literally singled out just with these four pieces. Of information and uh, they basically demonstrate in the paper that with 15 pieces of information like uh, you, you can read them here in the bottom it's enough to re-identify the 99.98 percent of the whole american population 
So then again, you know, imagine that you are collecting these 15 variables from your subject. Then I'm pretty sure Finland is even smaller. You, I'm sure you will even need less to uniquely re-identify somebody. Yeah? So basically the take on message is that the more data you start adding, the lower the gain goes. So the gain anonymity, anonymity even though you wanted to have it in your study, you're, you're not able to to fulfill it anymore. So then, of course, the more the richer the data, the more it might become easier to re-identify somebody. So then this is the so-called re-identification finger, from fingerprinting. So imagine that you know, the, it basically in practice you mean that you start collecting anything related to the body of an individual, the actual fingerprint, or the genome sequence of the individual, how they move their eyes, how the brain, you know, their average brain activity, the shape of their brain, the time series of their heart, how they walk, their voice, you know, for each of these uh, um, pieces of data that you can get from the body of an individual, there is a percentage of accuracy where you can re-identify somebody. And the percentages of accuracy, I'm actually preparing a nice table for a document for another project, but I'm really going through the literature and show, for example, that when it comes to voice, the technology right now is at 95% accuracy. So with a piece of speech from somebody, you know that with a 95% accuracy, you can re-identify that person. Now, of course, you know, it doesn't mean, so this is what I mean, this is also always important to remember, it doesn't mean that if you play to me, some five seconds of the voice of somebody i'm not i might not be able to tell who that person is you know but what it means is that somewhere somebody and especially in this case you know an authority might have the recording that could be matched that could be easily tracked you know okay that voice corresponds to enrico and the same is for all other time series or this kind of more complex spatial data like fingerprint or dna so this is the case of the the identification that I was mentioning earlier. So it's clear that you are not able to anonymize this data unless unless you start destroying the data that you really, you know, remove long pieces of the DNA or or you know, well basically there are, you know, you, you, you understand it's like the histogram that I showed earlier, the more you blur stuff. And then maybe the more the data becomes anonymous, but at the same time it becomes also unusable. But you can still at least remove these direct identifiers. So let's imagine that you get actual fingerprints and for each fingerprint there's a name attached. Maybe for your research purposes, if you research you know, the shape of fingerprints, whatever that research is, um, you don't really need to have the name attached to fingerprints. You're happy just to have the fingerprints. You still treat them as a very sensitive data because you know that somebody might be linked and might be re-identified, but at least you know there's no name and surname written attached to every image of the fingerprint. So this is what I meant also earlier that the technology is so advancing that you know, let's say with faces that you do an interview and you would be happy to blur out the face. Well, there are machine learning technologies that can basically try to that try to re-synthesize the face. So this technology by by Google Labs, their input image is just a eight times eight pixelated image, and then they basically you know reconstruct the face given just this this pixel. Of course, you know, it's different from the ground truth, meaning that, you know, this is just uh, with this machine learning would basically mean that some some software has seen many pictures and this software knows that when there's a picture like this, then most likely the original picture was something like this, you know. So it's not exactly the same as you would get in the, you know, in the real picture of the person that was used to obtain this, but it could be enough to you know, for example, find a find a criminal from some from you know. So if you remember this TV show, this what was it CSI that they were always you know zooming in, and it's basically you know with the technology that we have these days, we can really zoom in and 
to like find the who was the criminal in the blurry in the blurry CCTV camera. And what's more scary is that uh, the technologies of machine learning they are even they're even able, for example, to regenerate, for example, faces. So I mentioned that earlier that when it comes to the brain images, we don't we often don't need to store the face. So the participants remove and basically the part from the brain image that are not needed. So the nose and the mouth, all that stuff that we don't really need. But with some technology, you can reconstruct. With machine learning, you can reconstruct those those mouths and faces. So of course, it's not exactly the same. This nose, that's the original nose. It's a little bit different than the nose invented by the machine. But you know, it's once again might not be too far away from the from the actual picture when you when you compare it. So in some cases, it works well, like um, like we showed with this K anonymity when it goes to one for some people. Other recent technology again in machine learning and synthesis is that given, for example, um, just the speech of a person, so just the text, you can actually uh, synthesize their face. So from the audio and information of that person, you might be able to to generate the the actual face of the individual. So once again, of course, you know it's. Um, it's not exactly one to one, but you can understand now, you know, even ethically, in the sense of the ethical use of technology, how these things can be used also in a in a, in a wrong way. Okay, I think. Um, oh yeah, another thing that it's important to mention, of course, is the that when you're studying a rare population, you know, there might be higher chances that the participant can be re-identified. So. Imagine that you're studying somebody with a, with a rare disease in Finland, for example. Maybe this person wrote about this rare disease in a blog post or in a or in a or in an interview. So you know, or other could be individuals that are very famous. You might have a celebrity coming to your experiment, and some people maybe saw the celebrity entering, you know, to your lab. Then it wouldn't be too difficult to re-identify this. Uh, this famous individual, let's say, from an interview. Of course, in some cases, you know, it doesn't mean that it's always need to be anonymous. In some cases, you might be writing, for example, a monography about a famous architect or a famous musician. So it's it's clear that you know you are talking about that person, and you know, I'm not saying that you always need to remove and de identify everything. But you know, according to your goal, you might you might, for example, not want to measure any any celebrity you know, and all include any celebrity in your, in your study. Okay, maybe now it's two minutes past one. It's a good moment for a break. So maybe I'll stop sharing. These were joined, but I believe they were two different ones. And so somebody is asking, um, Sometimes we need to work with data on a PC that is provided by the data owner, but their machine does not have software required to perform locational analysis. And maybe it is the same, actually. It is the same question. So what would happen if we remove the linkage between the sample and the locational data? I want to see the average vote in time. Is this data anonymized? Yeah, Dan, excellent. Thank you, Dan, for already replying. Thank you for being here. He is the expert on this, and he will cover this on um, on day three. So, as it looks already, that you know <clears throat> might not be anonymized yet. So, you might break some sort of uh, how do they call it, like data use agreement, if this Helsinki municipality kind of you know did not allow you to take the data out. So you need to you, know, you need to stick to their rules. It's, it's a complicated issue, unfortunately. I understand that it's a lot. So not really in the scope of the course, but what are examples of not anonymizing the data? So if research subject would like to go on the record. <clears throat> well, I'm not the I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> as I always say, although most maybe we have a, a lawyer in the room, but in some cases, like I mentioned, you might be writing about a specific 
you know, that you might be writing an article on the most famous Finnish pianist that everybody knows. So, you know, in some cases, you might have, uh, you know, you might have the the permission kind of of the subject to, you know, that that is well known that the data can be published. I think that usually it's, um, if Pave is around, she can comment, but I would answer that, that uh, if you are, you know, if you're publishing some personal data on behalf of someone else, then this person should give you kind of this, uh, like that the legal basis for doing so is, is based on consent. But, um, you know, that it, it's not what we normally do with research data where the legal basis is public interest. I don't know if maybe is here and can Yeah, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, Enrico. Yes, I, I agree with you that it's, uh, it's, it's possible. Uh, I mean, you don't have to anonymize everything, of course. Um, but I, I, I agree with Enrico that, that then you should seek the consent of the data subject and you should list in the, in the things that they are consenting to, that they are agreeing that whatever it is regarding their person will be will be published and is it that then they would even have the rights that say that in a few years they change their mind and they want everything to be removed they would have the right. well yes that that is the uh, thing with with consent that um if you withdraw it then 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 you have to destroy the data in 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 principle um, in some cases, you can perhaps still rely on uh, on um, scientific research and public interest as your legal basis. But um, yeah, but I mean, if you have already published um, their data in, uh, in in like a conference, for example, if you have displayed displayed something at the conference, of course, it's not possible to to um, with, withdraw that data afterwards, but but there may be something still that you can. So you would have to assess it on a um, case by case basis. Yeah. Um, and um, and I would also like to add that uh, whatever you do, it's um, when when you do process personal data, you should as a minimum attempt to pseudonymize the data. Uh, and. Um, and anonymization is, as Enrico has explained, is not always always possible. But but um, it's not a good idea to not even try to pseudonymize the data because then uh, everything, then all your data and and people's direct identifiers, if they are all stored in the same place, then there is a, a high risk of of uh, if there's a data leakage or, or something like that, that that all this data will be uh, displayed to the world and that's not a good idea yeah i guess that here the case that i can imagine because here the person wrote the subjects would like to go on the record mm. maybe they're interviewing i don't know the ceo of kone and everybody knows who is the ceo of kone yeah so you can, yeah. You can write down a, yeah a absolutely ab absolutely i mean as long as you are uh clear in your communications what it is that you would publish and as long as the person understands so yeah, of course, there are always exceptions to the main rule. Yeah. How important is taking consent from a patient? What kind of consent should be taken? Well, I would say that even not just for patient, from anyone. So, well, <laughs> so let's let's say that from anyone who is an adult and is able to you know understand the text for example that you explain what happens in your study whether they are a patient or not you you can get the so-called there are at, at least at alto we, we we recommend doing this type of there are two kind of forms that you provide the subject that one is the consent to take part to the study so this kind of fulfills more like the ethical consent what the tank guidelines would uh, would um, basically saying and then there is more kind of the legal basis that often for for research is public interest but sometimes it is based on consent so this is kind of comes from the gdpr so there are two types of 
there is the consent related to the processing of the personal data according to GDPR, but there's also this ethical consent that you want to take part of my study. So this consent you always ask, even if you're not processing personal data, because it's ethical to ask somebody, you know, do you want to be the subject of my study? Now, when it comes to patients, if this is a study, you know, that they can express, you know, that it's clear that they can participate to your study and answer, etc., it falls into the same category. But a different story would be if this is medical data that was collected in the past for other purposes, and for example, it's not possible for you to, you know, go back to all those individuals and ask them, do you want to be part of my study? So lady is listening, so she can correct me or say it better. But is in this case, in the case of past medical data, I stress medical because the person you ask for a patient, then this falls or better this might fall under the secondary use of medical data which is a special case that often means fin data which basically there is an entity in finland called fin data where it's going to handle this type of uh, do you see the fin data page yeah it's going to handle this type of uh, kind of request that you know that you need to process all the subjects with whether heart attack in the past uh, 10 years from whose data bank you know so then in that case you might not be able to reach out each patient because they don't even give you the the, the way to reach out to each patient but then you it falls under the secondary use of uh, medical data you need to apply from fin data so it's a much more complicated more complicated procedure yes that's that's to... that's correct yes absolutely then who is responsible for data anonymization, the person using it or the person acquiring and distributing it? Well, this is a very good question because this is also something that annoys me a bit with both kind of research plans and grant applications and registration that sometimes people, I mean, I, I don't, you know, I'm not accusing the scientists of the researchers, they are busy people, but they would just say, we will anonymize the data and everything will be fine, you know? It's, um, I'm a bit skeptical myself that, you know, but um, again, you know, I don't want to put the pressure on this, on, you know, because the, cause the research is, which in the end means the doctoral students, they need to do everything. And now they have one more thing in their list, which is anonymizing the data. But basically in general, you know, if there is a person who is responsible of the data, so usually the PI, the senior, that for example has collected the data set or has supervised the students the researchers collecting the data set then this person should is kind of the responsible in a sense that if something goes wrong it goes you know to this person and um, you know i wouldn't give the responsibility i wouldn't pass my completely uh, not like mm, how can i say I, I collected some personal data and I do not anonymize it. I'm not going to give it to my friend from Esk University, even though I know there is a good scientist and they can do good things. But, uh, you know, the subjects who gave me the original data, maybe they didn't want that, you know, that they were going to be uh, part of some other analysis, some other study in uh, by somewhere else. So in general, whoever I wouldn't say owns the data, but whoever collects the data and manages the first release of the data should take care of the anonymization. Then, of course, this is a different story. If you are given some data and then you realize, you know, here there's names and surnames and everything. This has happened to me that people ask me for a quick analysis and then I realized that they gave me, there was everything there, even the enkiloturnus. So, you know, I can just kind of close my eyes and tell them maybe, you know, before sending this data around with emails, you should, you know, clean it and anonymize it a, a little bit, but it wouldn't be my responsibility as a, as a receiver, as a person who, who gets the data to start the identifying for them. So to answer to this, who collects the data slash manages the data originally is the responsible person. Yes, uh, Enrico, I would uh, like to add add to this um, 
that um, if the data has been anonymized, then it's not personal data according to the GDPR anymore. And that makes things uh, much simpler uh, if you want to share that data, because then you don't have to inform the data subjects uh, on your privacy notice uh, about the sharing of the data with people outside of your own organization or, or whoever is the controller of the data. Uh, and also there is no need to make, make a separate agreement regarding uh, secure handling of, of the personal data. So if you can anonymize data, uh, then you don't need to consider the requirements of the GDPR anymore. But if you are not able to anonymize the data and if, if you would provide, whether it's pseudonymized or, or not pseudonymized data, uh, it's personal data, and then you do have to inform the data subjects and the privacy notice about the sharing of, of, of their personal data to any external parties. And, um, and then you also have to make a separate agreement with the recipient of, of the data where you agree on, on data security. Uh, so it's really important to bear, bear these issues in mind. So unless it's anonymized data, you can never just go ahead and share the data, but you have to take care of the legal requirements as well before sharing anything. Thank you, Pavi. Another question for researchers. What are the implications some direct identifiers leak? So I'm not sure if there are criminal implications if I I'm not sure about it, you know, what or, or maybe there are what would happen again, sorry, Pavi, <laughs> to ask you. Uh, yes, it's a good question and I'm I'm sorry I don't have a uh, a definite answer uh, either. I, I would think that there are criminal implications, uh, but uh, but I haven't actually looked up the relevant provisions in the in the in Finnish legislation. But but it would clearly be um, um, a, a data leak, yeah. and um, and I think that there would definitely be a liability uh, to the person or organization who leaked the personal data. Also, if there is a, a data leak, um, then the data protection ombudsman has to be contacted uh, and also the organization's own data protection officer has to be contacted um, and, and the people whose uh, personal data has leaked would in in great situations also have to be contacted in in person so so this is this is something that needs to be uh considered uh very and taken very seriously and uh and the vastam case which was in the in the press uh for several weeks was it earlier this year or, or last year i don't even remember anymore um but in in that case uh it's likely that uh, that, that there will be criminal sanctions as well. In addition to that, there will probably be financial liability to the, to the people whose data has, has been leaked. So, so yeah, these are matters to be taken seriously. Yeah, good point. How to store interview recordings that cannot be anonymized because of voice. So I'm going to answer with the link meaning that actually at alto let's see if i'm able to find the page quickly rdm so um, in our trainings no not to login one second So then I'm not sure if this page is open for everyone, but at least for those at Alto, um, in the series of RDM trainings, this is also listed in the RDM trainings. I think in the last uh, October, there was a specific lecture on how to store um, personal data. Let's see. 
handling of personal data this is also a good one that you can watch if you want we have a more recent one it's uh, we gave it to me and Tyvi, which covers more these topics that we mentioned here and then how to store and share personal confidential data by Hillary Dr. Maki so there's the slides here and uh, there's also the video so this might answer your your question so I can paste the link in the HackMD shop the lecture and if you're not from Alto I guess the best is that you ask your IT experts security people whatever what are the ways of of dealing but I will cover I will try to cover for example some of um how can I say uh, secure workflows so that you don't need for example to use the, the processing that the, even the listening of the interview doesn't come from your laptop but everything can happen in a remote machine at Alto so that you know that um, let's say your laptop gets stolen or something like that then you know that the data is safe and stored in the in the cloud system of alto but i will i will show actually how to do this in practice okay i think it was good to have some questions and of course switch on your microphone if you feel like but no pressure let's um, continue a little bit with the background part so we covered the first um, two section and um, now we cover the rest and then the last hour we can actually be peer reviewers you will be peer reviewers of a of a paper that you will be asked to tell you know if it was a good paper or not so i was here with the slides let me close some zoom windows all right so maybe some other concepts that i that you will come across with this workshop and i might have mentioned already is um it's it's good to mention here and remind that the goal of this purpose is to of this workshop is to be practical so that you actually um, de identify or anonymize or pseudo anonymize data but uh, there are other concepts that relate to so most of the data that we work with this week is so-called microdata so microdata basically means that in your data in your data set that the data set is structured like a table so like an excel like an excel uh, document so that each row is about an individual and then the columns can be about items or personal data of this individual so this is called microdata and in this course i also call it tabular data for this microdata, as I gave you the example already of the age distribution in the small village, we can define things like the k-anonymity, and there are other concepts like l-diversity, t-distance, and things like that. We don't need to go through the mathematics, it's beyond the scope. Actually, here in the bottom, if you want to take that course, that is about the mathematics and algorithms of this stuff. It's a computer science course at Alto. But in general, you know, these are like the data that we work with, with is at the level of a single individual and the anonymization means that we want to blur some things from the single individual blur as much as we can blur so that we can still do some correlation some model fitting without losing completely the you know the information for our study but then other concepts that you might see somewhere else are the concept for example of differential privacy the differential privacy the idea is that that you work with aggregated statistics for example i don't know the average age of somebody living in a specific postcode so this would basically mean that if you remove a single individual so like the way the differential privacy happens is that often you query a database so imagine that you that you want to ask the Tilastokeskus, the statistics finland to run a query for you and you have an hypothesis that the average age in a in a location in a in a postcode in Finland might correlate with the income, you know, with the amount of money that that people make. So maybe this is your hypothesis, and you want to test this uh, 
correlation. So the data that Elastotiscus provides is not going to be micro data. So you're not going to have a single line in Excel with every line corresponding to an individual and their income and their postcode. But you're going to get kind of aggregated data using differential privacy, which would basically mean that even if you remove one subject from that postcode, the number, in this case, average age and average income, is more or less the same. If it wouldn't be the same with differential privacy, some noise is added to the original data. So that basically you can kind of, you know, if you ask, if you run many queries using this differential privacy, it's still impossible to go back to an individual. So most, meaning 99% of the cases that are in this Zoom room and are also at Alto, they deal with micro data. So you have one entry per individual, sometimes even more than one entry per individual, because maybe you, you, you know, this, you see these people more than once. So you collect also so-called longitudinal data. But in some cases, and this is more when you work with registry, with biobanks, with, um, you know, larger amount of population, then you can use the differential privacy. Differential privacy is kind of provable anonymous, meaning that this is the type of data that DHL might even release openly, that you can get, you know, the, this type of, um, I don't know, for example, given this, the district, the school district, you get the number of, uh, uh, of uh, students who, of pupils who got uh, COVID positive. So this is a data that, for example, is, is released every week by, by even the Helsinki municipality. So that, you know, if you have an hypothesis that in some district there might be more cases of pupils with the COVID, then you can still test it. But they use differential privacy. It would be impossible for you to single out, you know, in individuals. But then again, you know, the devil's advocate comes in and says, well, yes, it might be impossible, but I know that my neighbor was, you know, tested positive. So then you start adding this kind of, uh, secret knowledge or extra knowledge, which in practice it makes anonymization always <laughs> un unusable or, or almost impossible because then even though the data that ASIC University, that, sorry, that ASIC City releases about the pupils and their COVID tests, you, you might still be able to say, okay, that, that person there is those kids that I know because they live in my, in my Kerrostalo. <laughs> so, you know, here, there's, it's a very nice, there are some nice materials here. If you want to learn more about the mathematics, you don't even need to understand mathematics or code. It's, it's explained quite, quite well in the, in the slides, but, you know, feel free to explore that. And if you have questions, I'm happy to answer, you know, the weekend, because here we are, we are so diverse. So if some of you wants to go deeper on these concepts, I'm happy to, you know, take you into more deeper topics. And if some are just happy, to, that they have micro data and they need to kind of minimize a bit their micro data. That's okay, and and this is why we're here. Okay, so the questions uh, we got them already. Maybe one questions that kind of already happened that of I often get is like, do I really need to k anonymize or in general anonymize you know something? I think it's important to remember that if you have a reason to work with them direct identifier and very personal data even sensitive personal data you can do it there's no nobody stops you for working with such data it's just that then you know the more sensitive and you know is the data the more you want to be careful so for example you know age it's not a rule that you always have to to k anonymize the age like i gave in the example maybe you start in normative models where you 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 look in this case at the at the age of a, an individual and there what is this like um, height maybe yeah statue so you know you've you've seen maybe these kind of curves so it's obvious that in some cases we really want to have the exact age even not just as a integer but even as a you know as the date of birth but then in some other cases maybe you're just running some questionnaire among students and you just need to tell you know where these people in their 20s or in their 40s maybe that's enough then you don't really need the exact age because you're not going to build a 
normative model. So, you know, don't feel that somebody is putting limits to your research questions. You can still research as much as you want, but you just need to know that with more responsibility, you know, comes more or like or with more sensitivity of the data comes more, more responsibility on, on you and the people in your team and the organization you work. Okay, so now a bit of practical things and the focus now would be with micro data for this week. I remind you that the goal for today is that you're able to see a data set and decide is this anonymous enough, should they improve it, kind of like you, this is the exercise that we will do in the next hour that you will be, you are a peer reviewer of a paper with a data set and then you need to be critical because the data is attached to the paper, it's going to be published with the paper and then you need to suggest to the to the authors that you know is it okay with their anonymization technique or do they need to improve and why but in general so there are kind of two strategies of anonymization and uh, often here we've been talking about the anonymization after the data has been collected but the best thing of course is anonymization before data collection which means if you don't need it, don't collect it. It's a, it's a trivial, silly rule, but it, um, you know, it's, it's kind of in the core of most of these uh, regulations and uh, personal laws, personal privacy, that is the kind of privacy by design. So that if you plan your research with minimization in mind, you know, what is the minimum amount of data that you need? It can be justified from previous studies or from existing protocols or maybe because you have a, an hypothesis, a clear hypothesis, you know, that you can mention, for example, in the pre-registration or in your data management plan. And then it's, it's clear that, let's say that in your strong hypothesis based on the literature, age as a group age is enough. Then just collect the group age. Don't collect the exact age, etc. for all these other uh, direct identifiers. In general, data management plans that are often attached with grant applications. So in grant application, you should mention about your anonymization strategy. This is, of course, not just good from some sort of scientific ethic point of view, that you show that you took care of this, but also for those reviewers of your grant that you know they can clearly see, OK, this person knows their data and understand that there are risks and even knows the tools that could be used to minimize these risks. And once again, maybe it's impossible to anonymize your data, then you just specify why it's impossible and why more strict storage or processing systems can be used. And then finally, with this anonymization before the data collection, we also always need to consider the ethical aspects. So we're not just doing this to make, you know, to fulfill the GDPR, whatever, criteria, but we might also collect health data and come across incidental and find it. So this is a tricky one because here I'm telling you don't collect something that you don't need. But here I'm actually telling you, well, maybe at the first stage, if you know that the type of data you're collecting could identify something related to the health of an individual, then maybe keep the email address, for example, of the person that came to your to your study. So in this case, for example, at Alto, we have an MRI scanner and people run studies with the, basically take a picture of the, of the brain. It is not designed for kind of, you know, the research that we do here is not medical. The scanning sequences are very similar, but can, one can argue there are not exactly those used in the hospital, but still you might be able to see something kind of so-called incidental finding in the brain of a participant. So it is good, it's ethically good to keep still the contact details of the participants so you can direct, direct them, for example, to go to a specialist to, to have a second scan with another scanner to make sure that, you know, that it's not an artifact that the, or if there's something. So you see, once again, there is never a rule, mechanical rule that we follow like robots. But given the data you collect and also this ethical implication, you might not want to minimize it immediately. You might want to wait a bit or, or then in other cases, you might want to start from the first day of data collection with data that is 
as anonymous as possible. So this, I gave an example that I tweeted a few years ago, is that sometimes I take, I mean, I love to take part to questionnaires, send me your questionnaires if you're running questionnaires, but, um, and of course I also am a strong promoter of open science. I'm happy if I take part of the questionnaire and I know that their data will be open and will be reused. And so it's, it's wonderful, but then, it's not enough for me as a subject, or maybe as a subject who knows these things, that that you write in your constant form of your questionnaire, don't worry, we will anonymize the data before releasing it. Then maybe tell me what you're gonna do. So if you ask me if in the questionnaire, this was the real case that happened, it was a questionnaire on um, doctoral students who finished their doctorate in Finland. If you start asking me my nationality, where I did my master, where I did my PhD and what was the field, because not many Italians, males, graduated in cognitive neuroscience in Finland, you know. So if this data is kept in the open data attached to this study, it's obvious that that would be me and a couple of Google searches and anyone can, you know, you don't even need to know me. It, it, it's something that anyone can do. If then they would have asked, you know, let's say then instead of asking for Italy, they would have asked for, do you live in Finland? Are you from Finland or are you from outside Finland? Then I would know, I would feel already more more safe kind of answering to the questionnaires because I know that, you know, they, they have no idea if, I, if I'm from USA or if I'm from Italy. So, you know, do not promise that you will open the data, that you have an anonymization strategy if you don't have an actual anonymization strategy that you can show before collecting the data. Um, so maybe final notes, restrict as much as possible the range of answers. So when you're designing a questionnaire, meaning that we're still talking about anonymization before data collection, avoid as much as possible the free answer. So limit your answer and you can look at the limits in the previous studies Maybe they already define, let's say that, I don't know, you want to ask about the profession of an individual. Don't leave it as an open field because people might write, you know, I'm a staff scientist at Alto. There's not many of us, it may be, you know, less than 20. So already that becomes, if I really write the title of my profession, it gets much easier. But if you just write, I work in the university, it can be, you know, it, it gets the bigger, bigger more anonymous data data collection. And then what I just mentioned in the example, do not promise that the data will be fully anonymous if you don't have kind of any data to show it. If it's, if it's you know, if a participant can start questioning that they can, they could identify themselves in your questionnaire, then maybe don't claim that the data is fully anonymous, but just call it personal data and treat it as personal data. There's nothing wrong with working with personal data. So I'd rather tell the subjects that I'm collecting personal data and I give a privacy notice, even though I'm just asking about their movie taste and their, I don't know, and their age and that's it. Okay, so this was the anonymization before data collection. And then, of course, this is what we focus on this course is the anonymization after the data collection. So then uh, the tabular data that we will um, be identify on Thursday is the so-called participants background information can be these personal variables that I mentioned, but can also be the you know, answer to the questionnaire or tests, neuropsychological tests and whatever. So there are different techniques for kind of uh, anonymizing this type of data, whether you destroy it, you obfuscate it or you generalize it. For example, the K-anonymity example that I gave earlier was an example of generalization. But if there would be name and surname in my in my tabular data, I would just destroy it. I don't need name and surname if I don't need to contact this person anymore. So here I will show from this page, but it's the same page that I mentioned earlier about the Finnish social data archive. Um, and then things get more complicated when the kind of complexity of the data increases. So with health data fingerprints, bits of DNA, brain images, whatever, you know, we can't anonymize, we can only pseudo anonymize, we can only de-identify, we can remove direct identifiers. 
And for this, uh, I would show some examples of the DICOM files that are used a lot more, maybe in medical fields rather than in research, but also here I can also show you other types of files with that at least you mentioned <clears throat> when you registered that you work with. Then we'll go over geospatial data and in general, you know, you can still express your wishes. So if there's a type of data that we should cover, add it to the hack and be and uh, you know, the course, the content of the course can still be changed to what other people ask. So this is the table from that um, page of the FSD of the social archive in Tampere. And so for example, here they define these three types of identifiers that I mentioned earlier, the direct identifier, strong, indirect and indirect, and then kind of the anonymization method. I'm actually working on a table like this that extends and also adds kind of what is the likelihood of re-identifying somebody. So of course, that personal identification number, that's a unique number. So of course, you given that number and you go to, I don't know, police office, you can re-identify a person uniquely. Then, you know, with full name, if your name is, I don't know, I checked this, um, that Ilastokescus publishes the distribution of surnames. So if your surname is Korhonen, for example, there are 270,000 Korhonen in Finland. So then you're, you know, you're, you're quite fine if your surname is Korhonen. But then if your surname is like mine, there's just four in Finland. So it becomes a direct identifier. In general, it's not you starting to decide, okay, should I add, remove it or not? Just remove it. You, know, you don't really need to keep it in your data unless, of course, I mean, if, you, if you're doing a longitudinal study that you need to contact the subject again in one year or a few years. And then, you know, you can follow that the table is really long in the in the link here below so you can check it you can check it yourself later so then some tools on how to identify micro data tabular data so on thursday i'm gonna give you a demo of amnesia and then you're gonna try amnesia on some data that i give you and also arx arx i'm not sure if so if you want to try it this requires installation and in some cases i know that people don't have the actually somebody was just mentioning that someone sometimes you don't have the right to install new software on your on your computer but it's more powerful than amnesia so eventually you know you can spend some time also checking this if it's useful for you but in general you know if the more you are uh, better with coding whether it's python or r or whatever there might exist libraries that could help you in doing this so amnesia is a good option if you're not good in coding or if you don't have time yet to learn or those tools that you need to kind of do it yourself with some coding but uh, you know as i mentioned at the beginning try to find a tool that is most fit to your skills and to your capacity and start from there and then eventually realize amnesia was good but it takes me too long time to define their age range for example then maybe uh, if you try to learn Python or collaborate with somebody who knows some Python and um, can help you with the approach. Don't worry now about the other links because we will go back. Okay, so now it's two o'clock. Maybe we don't need to go to the workflows yet. And um, we could have another break. And uh, we're running a bit late because I spent a little bit more time on the questions, but I hope that it was useful. I don't have many slides left, like a three plus three plus four, seven slides. So we can briefly cover these seven slides after the break at 14.15. And after that, we do the exercise, meaning the exercise will be that you are peer reviewers of a paper. And this paper, they claim that they want to publish some anonymous data attached with the paper. And you need to be a reviewer number two or number three and being very critical and say that actually, you know, this data is not anonymized well enough. Or is it? Maybe it is. I don't want to. If you have other questions, I leave the hack and dig open here. I'll paste again the link in the chat. If you lost it. 
and I'm going to be silent for 15 minutes so you can stretch your legs, do a exercise, get a glass of something and see you in 15 minutes. And then it asks you, are you, do you need Linux, Alto Linux or do you prefer Alto Windows? You pick your favorite operating system and then what you see after is exactly the same that you would see when you log in into Alto Linux or Alto Windows workstation with your files and your permissions and whatever project folders and uh, you know it takes some time now because basically these are all many i think they're 100 and or almost 200 virtual machines so now they're booting up a virtual machine and i can use it from the browser so this is happening inside my chrome browser when it decides to start of course now that i'm giving a demo <laughs> it's gonna take longer because the computer knows that there's 30 people watching. Oh, come on. Why is that logging me? Okay, I'll switch. Let's go to Windows. Okay, I'm going to the Windows machine. The Linux didn't boot. I don't know why. I promise you it works. <laughs> I mean, I used it daily. Um, so now it's logging me into a Windows workstation. So this is the same. So if you go on campus and find a machine with Alto Windows and log in. Okay. Yes, preparing Windows. But basically, so this is as secure as it can get. Of course, with the higher risk, you might want higher security. And there are many other options. We can mention them. I can go some more details later, but at least here, you know that with this type of processing, the, the files, the content, the sensitive data, everything stays within the Alto cloud. What comes to your computer is just kind of the image of this remote workstation. I let it prepare in the background and then I show you how it looks like. And then maybe you don't need to this also i'm going to skip this you can check the slides yourself but we basically don't have yet a process for opening and sharing data that is kind of um, personal data so like Patty lindstrom mentioned earlier sharing anonymous data it's easy because it's fully anonymous it's not personal data but with personal data it's tricky so now we are defining a process on um, how can we kind of you know share share data and open data it will not be fully open in a sense that you could just anyone can just click and start downloading the brain image of your subject or the answers of the questionnaires it can be open on demand and um, so this is coming and will be there all right but now let's do the exercise okay this is the alto window so now inside my web browser there's a, a remote machine with the windows and i can use it you know as i would normally use the alto windows machine with all the programs and everything else and here i can have my safe secure data instead of moving it to my laptop okay now let's if you don't have any other question so yeah actually vdi if you want to install it on your soft on your machine yes but you can now i was using from from the web browser so you can even I think it works even from a mobile phone, from an iPad. So if you want to install the client, yes, but anyway, work in any browser. Okay, you can ask more question here. I can remove this bit. Just remember. Um, uh, well, you don't need to. You don't need to tell me every time your name is your name. If you wrote it once, I have the saved chat and at the end I mark those who need the credits. Okay, now for the exercise, I added the link here. And um, so the goal of today was is, is kind of identifying the problem. So what I wanted you to become at the end of today, and I hope you are getting there, is that you understood the importance of data anonymization. And now you have kind of the expertise 
you know, or the beginning of the core expertise to evaluate if a data set is anonymous. I don't think this is a trivial task. I will, the, the example I made here, this is the data set. It's a silly one. Of course, it's a fake data synthesized from a fake study. You know, it's, it's obvious that it's a silly one, but what I want you, you know, what I want you to do is open the data set and be as if you were a reviewer of a journal like you've been doing pre-review. So now I'm gonna click on the link here. This is from the page, the main page of the course. I can paste the link again in the Zoom for your convenience. So if you scroll down to the timetable for day one, at the end, there's this link on this data set. So this is what these scientists wrote in their paper. This is like the method sections of their paper. So already here in the method section, one can be critical. So imagine you are a peer review and you need to be critical in the method section because already here there's something fishy that this shouldn't pass peer review. And then in the bottom, let me hide the, uh, one sec. Those are the zoom control bar. That, okay. And then in the bottom, there is this, um, there is this uh, other sheet, which is called data set. And this is the actual data. So there are 1000 subjects and the personal data that I'm storing here is their initials, their age, their sex, their zip code, an impostal code and their hobby. The hypothesis, the great hypothesis of this scientist was to, I don't remember, um, they want to study the in preferred leisure activity from the Finnish population. They want to build whatever magic science about the hobbies of Finnish people, okay? And in their paper, these scientists are claiming that this data is anonymized, specifically with the, some K anonymity for the zip code. So your task here is to peer review this bit of the method section of this paper and this actual data set. So there's many ways to do this task. And because we are very diverse, some of you might be able to copy this data and load it into Python or Stata or R and pull out whatever, you know, verify, for example, that the K anonymity is exactly what they claim in the method section of their paper. So here they're claiming that there's a K anonymity bigger than 200. You can do it if you will know Python, but if you wouldn't know Python or Stata or R or whatever code programming language, this is something that you might be able to do even with the Excel. Now, I'm not expecting that everyone can use Excel. I understand that we are very diverse, but maybe try to figure out alone or with someone that, you know, you, you basically find a way together. So to help you with the task and to help you forming groups, we can divide the workload like this. So in room one, the people who wants to do it with Python can all go there. I will not join you. You are free with yourself. Someone might take the lead or you might just want to do it all by yourself. So Python users, feel free to go to room one. You can go yourself and maybe I can specify the goal. Goal. The size is to write a peer review of the bit of methods section and the data set. So you need to, you know, write whatever is wrong about this, this, uh, this paper and, uh, and about the actual data set. So in room number one, all the Python users can go there and you can try to figure out a way to do it in Python. Also those who don't know Python, but they like to watch someone doing it in Python. You can ask some other uh, there in the breakout room to share the screen and maybe they show you how to load the data, this tabular data, and for example, look that, you know, is this K anonymity. And I will give you a hint, is the histogram here, like the one that I was showing, there you have 200 people as they claim in the, in the method section, or should something be fixed? 
the more error you find, <laughs> the, the more internet points you win. For room two, there are at least three Scala users. So if the Scala users are in the room, I don't know if you are here. I don't know if there's anyone who wants to do it in Scala, but you know, you can all go to room number two. In room three, at least two of you or three mentioned that you prefer R. So R users can eventually go there. And in room number four, I would say Google Sheet or Excel. This task of peer review is also possible to be done using just Excel. And actually me, myself as a peer reviewer, I sometimes review, like I, I review papers for scientific data, for example, which is a journal that releases data sets. And sometimes it's enough to do these things with Excel, pull up a quick picture with Excel. Once again, you know, I understand that you might not be familiar with any of these four tools, solutions as a peer reviewer, but uh, feel free to join one of the breakout rooms. Are there any questions? You can ask, switch on your microphone, you can write the question here on Hackmd, 